agenda. Call the meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and welcome to the July 15th, 2014 Pulse Falls City Council meeting. We just concluded a budget workshop uh, prior to the meeting and are now moving into the regular meeting. Um, clerk will note that all council members are present. And a couple of announcements. Uh, congratulations to the graduating River City Leadership Class. Among those graduating today were the city's finance director, Finance Director Jason Faulkner, Detective Sergeant Dave Beck, and Assistant City Engineer Rob Paulus. Congratulations uh, to all you folks. I know Carrie is also involved in the re uh, Leadership Academy, so thanks for all you do, and congratulations on finishing. Also, we received a letter, uh, I guess I should say, and I think Mr. Malloy said it as well. This should come as no surprise. Uh, Dear Mayor Jacobson and Council Members, it is my pleasure to inform you that the Post Falls Police Department has successfully completed the Idaho Chiefs of Police, Police Association reaccreditation process. During an on-site inspection by members of the ICOPA accreditation team on June 23, 2014, your Police Department was found to be in compliance with all accreditation standards set by ICOPA. This milestone achievement came with no small effort. Our special thanks go to out to Chief Scott Hogue and his staff for taking this opportunity and putting forth their efforts in meeting the accreditation standards set forth by ICOPA. This is an accomplishment that you and the citizens of Post Falls can be proud of as it demonstrates your dedication to maintaining a progressive and professional police department for your community. Once again, on behalf of the Idaho Chiefs of Police Association, we congratulate you and your city on this outstanding achievement. Sincerely, R. David Moore, retired Chief of Police, City of Blackfoot, ICOPA Accreditation Coordinator. Chief, Pat, congratulations, and please pass our congratulations on to staff. Good job. Are there any amendments to the agenda? There are none, sir. Thank you. Uh, I will find myself here. Are there any declarations of conflict? Seeing none, would you please present the consent calendar? It's such a short list. <laughs> Item A is minutes from July 1st, 2014. Item B is payables July 1st through July 7th, 2014. Item C is the Rathster Mountain Communications Tower Construction Award. And item D is a request to auction two surplus police vehicles. Any questions on the consent calendar? Mr. I have a Wolf. question. On item D, Chief, any idea what you're going to get for these cars? We send them to auction and we get usually between $600 and $900 out of those vehicles when they go to auction. Typically they're pretty worn out. These vehicles have about 120, 130,000 miles on them. And with idle time, you can almost double that. And so we don't get a whole lot out of them. The reason I ask is not so much the fact that what we can get out of them, but I noticed that there's that the car that's parked out at Walmart acts as somewhat of a deterrent. I wonder if for no more than we're getting out of those cars, if it wouldn't be better to have them parked someplace to Easily. slow the speeders down or be a deterrent in another place of business. Yeah, and we've had the Phantom, we call it the Phantom Car Program <laughs> for, uh, for a number of years. <laughs> Give it away, didn't I? Yeah, you did no, to the whole public. Anyway. But uh, <laughs> he, he was talking go, about Alan. Walmart and Spokane. <laughs> that one yeah. is too now. Um, New guy. Yeah. In fact, uh, when we had it on Celtis, there were several uh, times when there was for sale signs put on it and you know, that type of stuff. So get a lot of humor out of it. But we do uh, use a phantom car program, and the cars that we do use for that are surplus vehicles that we just don't strip all the equipment off of. So we do think about that, but I, I think we have a sufficient number of those right now. And so as we uh, get these vehicles that are just no longer serviceable even for that I mean a lot of these cars need some some serious work to them we feel it's best to send it to auction rather than put taxpayer dollars into them to keep them running okay Thank you. thankfully we don't have too many individuals who are stealing from Walmart watching this particular program so we're probably okay <laughs> <laughs> any, other Thanks, any, Shirley, any other questions you're gonna get a letter from somebody I know <laughs> with that I would entertain a motion 
I move to approve as presented. Second. second. Motion seconds. Further discussion? Clerk, please take the roll. Wilhelm? Aye. Hessong? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. I uh, neglected to uh, mention up front we do have three public hearings tonight. Uh, if you wish to testify in any of the public hearings, there's forms on the ideas. Please fill them out and give them to our clerk, and we will have them for the record. The first public hearing is the IAAR annexation. And with that, I will open public hearing. Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. If you bear with me real quick, the, uh, my presentation is actually in reverse order from A and B, so I'm going to get it straightened out here real quick. Oh, perfect. So the IAAR annexation, case file A-14-04, the applicant is IAAR Idaho LLC, and the representative is present this evening. The city council is being asked to review the annexation request, determine that the requested R1 zoning conforms to the Post Falls Comprehensive Plan, and approve the annexation request with the appropriate zoning. The project location, as you see here at the asterisk, is south of Maplewood Avenue and um, just east of um, Cedar Street a bit and north of Spokane River. The approximate size is 10 acres. The comp plan designation would be residential. The current land use is vacant and the current zoning would be Egg Suburban in Kootenai County. Surrounding land uses are residential or vacant and the water provided would be City Post Falls and sewer as well. And looking at the surrounding zoning, you've got some vacant R1 zone just to the west in the City of Post Falls and to the north, uh, R1 subdivision. To the east would be your area that's um, low density, residential in the county named it, called Egg Suburban with its uh, zoning designation north of Spokane River. The proposed zoning as you see here is would be for is more specifically 10 acres and <clears throat> per title 18 this would normally be processed under either the SC2 or SC3. But as you see and this river in the magenta color that approximate two acres extends into under the <coughs> high water mark it's the one percent chance of annual flood so <coughs> that would make the approximate buildable area less than eight acres and why that's important is because per section 18.04.040 administrative and structure subsection c within the title 18 smart code zoning in lands that are less than 10 acres it's up to city council to determine whether or not the annexation would be done under a smart code zoning designation or under conventional zoning designation so tonight i'll present both and it'll be up to you as when the public hearing concludes to determine the appropriate path going forward <coughs> with the sc2 zone it'd be one unit per five acres it's fairly similar to the R1S as it's the other egg type rural zone that we have within conventional of one unit an acre although it is significantly lower in density. When you look at the SC3 it's very very similar to the R1 zoning with uh, five units per acre but that's a maximum versus in the SC3 it's a minimum of three units per acre so there's a little difference there but as smart code has developed SC3 has been used as your typical single family home zone. So at this point, this will do the general introduction of uh, smart code and the application for annexation. Any questions, John? Thank you. Applicant, name for the record, please. You have 15 minutes.
<clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Drew Dittman, Lake City Engineering, 3909 North Schreiber Way, City of Coeur d'Alene. Uh, John pointed out a very similar <clears throat> map earlier, just showing the location of the property. Um, this is Maplewood Avenue right here. Cedar Street which is just off of the map. It's adjacent to the Everwood Estates and the Timber River subdivisions. Uh, it's surrounded uh, the yellow color you see there is, is currently R1 zone, so we've got R1 to the west and R1 to the north. Uh, we are requesting a R1 zone, as, as John had discussed, even though the property is slightly over that 10 acre threshold, it's actually 10.01 acres. Um, however, as you can see in the aerial, the, the southern portion of the property here is actually below the ordinary high watermark inundated, as John said, by the 1% annual chance floodplain. It's, it's unusable property. We can't build on it. Um, so really the net effect, uh, as you can see, we lose about two acres. So really we have an eight acre usable piece. That's why we're requesting the R1 traditional zoning that, and we have R1 to the west and to the north of the project. Uh, I think everything else is covered in the staff report. Uh, I don't have anything further unless you guys have questions for me. Any questions of Drew? Thank you. <coughs> Staff report. So the planning division reviewed this application request for the annexation and found that the property is within the Post Falls area city impact. The boundary of the proposed annexation is contiguous with city limits. The single family residential R1 zoning designation would be appropriate in considering the surrounding environment and would be consistent with the adjacent properties. The Eng engineering division had reviewed this in regards to transportation and found that the proposed annexation and requested land use classification would not adversely affect the city's transportation system. But <clears throat> also additional rights away would not be required along Maplewood Avenue. In regards to water reclamation, the city has the available facilities to service the proposed annexation. And for domestic water is that it's located adjacent to the properties along Maplewood Avenue and the city has the uh, facility to uh, facilitate the project. This here is a condition that if council chooses to um, go the path of smart code rather than conventional R1 that there'd be a condition that upon such time either that the land subdivides or that a residential permit because currently it's vacant there's no longer there's not a structure there, it's all vacant that a neighborhood plan shall be developed and approved prior to an issuance of such permit. Uh, typically with annexations in SMARCO, we would look at how the transportation pattern is and how it connects to adjoining communities and area and come up with a neighborhood plan. But in this, uh, this location, it may not be the most appropriate. So at this time, I'd stand for any questions you have on. Any questions, John? Thank you, Thank John. You. Clerk, do we have any one wishing to testify? Thank you, Shannon. Uh, Mr. Bob Flowers does wish to speak and is neutral. I don't know if I've ever said that about you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> neutral. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council. Bob Flowers. I couldn't think of a better use for this land than R1. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, we should take the smart code and send it back to wherever it came from. But uh, R1 would be perfect. And I believe that the next logical step with this annexation would be instead of stopping at Cedar, take it to Ross Point Road. And it, that, you got that whole section of homes in there that should have been part of the city a long time ago but for some reason never have and I think it would be a good idea sometime in the future to look at it but 
I can't think of a better purpose for that land down there than homes right now. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. That was all the testimony. Uh, I don't imagine that uh, oh, rebuttal time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a point of clarification. We are requesting the R1 zone. If you guys do decide to go the smart code route, we would prefer SC3 over the SC2. Thank you for the clarification. With that, I'll close the public hearing. Council deliberation, you'd like to start? I think it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. We like those. And I would agree with Bob Flowers, that would be perfect for R1. Yeah, just to address what Bob questioned is we, I don't think that we as a council are comfortable with blanket Sweeping. annexation but <laughs> if I had that power I'd probably do the same thing Bob and I'm okay with the R1 versus the uh, smart code. Uh, Joe, Kerry, any? Yes. I'd make a motion to <clears throat> approve the IAAR annexation file number A-14-04 with the R1 land use designation. Second. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Please take the roll. Henderson? Aye. Hissong? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, folks. Next public hearing Garrett, Adams, and Kassoon annexation A1403. That will open the public hearing. So the Garrett, Adams, and Kassoon annexation, case file A-14-03. The applicants are Randy and Ruth Wells, George Adams, and Robert Kassoon. The requested action is, is that City Council is being asked to review the annexation request, determine that the requested SC4 zoning conforms to the Post Falls Comprehensive Plan and Smart Code Zoning Ordinance, Title 18A, and approve the annexation request with SC4 zoning. There's been some previous action on this particular request <coughs> as part of the 15th, 16th realignment project, City Council authorized July of 2012, the execution of a letter of agreement to process this annexation application under the SC4 zoning designation, but with the understanding that the SC4 zoning was not a guarantee though. Project location is at here, right where you see the asterisk, east of Idaho and south of 16th Avenue. What's being, what you see here in blue is the five lots. You see the road going through here in that remaining triangular. That's actually technically a part of this lot to the south, but there's five lots that approximate to 15 acres. And you have R1 zoning to the north and west of this proposed annexation. And at the southwest corner, you do have some commercial and limited commercial. So going forward, as this develops, typically you wouldn't, in an ideal situation, have single family homes right next to commercial. You'd have some transitional uses. So you could see as this develops, some transitional and pattern of development, whatever that may be. Project size is approximately 15 acres, as stated. On the comprehensive plan, we have a conventional future land use map that uh, has designated this as residential, and a smart code uh, future land use map that has designated as G4 infill, and this would be an infill area. Current land use is residential and vacant, with the water being provided by City Post Falls, as well as the sewer. So as part of the introduction, as what we did with the Planning and Zoning Commission, is to present the SC4, kind of describe it a little bit, because we don't get a lot of smart code projects and annexations compared to other uh, conventional, <coughs> we're more familiar with conventional requests, and how it affects post falls in this area. So when you look at the smart code, the general character and description would be to provide for a mix of houses, uh, townhomes, small apartment buildings with scattered commercial balance between landscape and buildings. 
with some presence of some pedestrians. And in looking at residential, you can see that there's a difference between SC3 and SC4 and why SC3 is typically, as stated in the uh, previous public hearing, part of your uh, single family home type subdivision. And in SC4, you get a mixing of a residential that permits all the residential types within that zoning designation. When you look at lodging, office, and retail, it also permits that within that zone. So it's kind of a mixed form-based code that more or less <clears throat> allows it to morph with the, the surrounding environments as the, the market may choose. On the left-hand side of the screen, you see SC1 through SC3, 6. This is kind of the transitioning of how it transitions ideally from a rural to an urban setting. And what you see in the outline in red could be perceived as an approximate equivalent of this request as far as an area, considering when you look at Prairie to uh, Southeast Way. Also in the, the context of this annexation request, where does this fit within Post Falls and its location? It's about 0.66 miles just north of I-90. If you were to drive there via 16th Avenue, it would be 1.2 miles down 15th, and then you'd head south to the Spokane inter that interchange. And if you went 16th to 41, that would be about 2.8 miles that route. It's, uh, it's a less than a quarter mile, I mean, sorry, a half a mile from the intersection of Mullen and Idaho Street, and so that's where you see the Super One store, and it's a pretty busy intersection. Uh, around that area, you also have some, I think you have uh, manuf manufactured home park as well as some other mix between single family homes and multifamily. Also, to note is uh, <coughs> with the city being a little over 30,000 and this being a county pocket, and with areas in close proximity to our major transportation cores these type of requests, either it be an SC4 or other type of higher intense uses may become more common. And looking at the uh, transportation grid, what you see highlighted are mostly just the major thoroughfares, both going north, south, and east, west. So for the north, south ones, you got the Pleasant View, Spokane Street, Idaho Street, Greens Ferry, and Highway 41. You got east, west would be Prairie, Pole Line, 16th and Mullen Avenue and Celtis Way. As you see, this is at the southeast corner of uh, two major routes through Post Falls. Also, staff, you know, wanted to present how does this location in relation to overall uses, trends, uses, or what we foresee in area to transition. What you see in red of Highway 41 and along Celtis Way and Mullen Avenue are commercially oriented type developments up those corridors. On Spokane Street, you see some, some R2 duplex type development and just south at, in the orange, some multifamily type developments with some single family homes. With west of Post Falls being a mix between industrial and commercial with some residential. When you look at this uh, request in the context of the whole prairie, you can see how to the north, as stated earlier with that matrix, that it's rural to the up north, and, we, and as we transition to the south, it gets a little more urban. Hence, the, the picture on the left-hand side there, and in context. Also, when you look at, also we wanted to present, where are other SC4 zones in, in Post Falls currently? You see that as part of Crown Point, there's some SC4 at the northwest corner of a future busy intersection, Spokane Street and Prairie. You have uh, the SC4 as part of the city center plan to offer that mixed use, kind of more of an urban environment to facilitate, to facilitate that plan. Recently, we approved the SC4 part of the Micah Acres annexation, which is once again at a corner location between two intersecting uh, routes, and then th the crossings, which is was a part of uh, some alley-loaded product for that infill project at that time. And then in blue would be, this location would be the proposed location at 16th and uh, Idaho Street. So I apologize for the long-winded introduction, but I just want to give a little more context and, and, and 
kind of explanation of SC4 and how it relates to this request prior to the applicant. Thank you, John. Any questions, John, for the applicant? Thank you. Who's presenting for the applicant? Mr. Wells. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Council, thanks for uh, listening to all of this. Uh, yeah, we did put forth the uh, application for the annexation uh, and uh, through the advice and, and talking with the city, we decided on the uh, SC4 zoning. Uh, I was all for it until Bob said he'd like to see all SC4s or SC smart zoning thrown out and, and rural put mm -hmm. in, but we'll leave it as is. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, this basically all started when the city wanted to, you know, get the right of way on 15th, 16th, and and then uh, we were annexing uh, this particular property uh, that has the uh, property bordering Idaho and and uh, uh, now 15th, 16th, whatever you want to call it. And then Mr. Adams thought he would like to join in also because part of that uh, annex, part of the uh, road goes on his property, and then talking to Bob Kassoon next door, then he wanted to apply also. So we just kind of came in all at the same time. We've had several meetings with the city or with the uh, city department, planning and zoning department to structure this and the best way we could put it forward to, to bring it in. And, and uh, uh, so we would like to have the property brought into the city. Thank you. For the record, that's Randy Wells, the applicant. I'm sorry, Randy, I should have asked you to stay. Randy Wells, PO Box 430, Athol, Idaho. Thank you very much. Any questions of Randy? Thank you very much. Staff report. So the planning division looked at this and found that this is within the Post Falls area city impact. It is contiguous with the uh, boundaries of the city and that the <coughs> smart code SC4 zoning designation <coughs> may provide the <coughs> flexibility to provide a the appropriate zone for this transitioning area that's slightly awkward and being a busy intersection and close to some single-family homes as well as a major corridor with some commercial development along with it it would reduce the uh, the county pocket as you see here this here is the entire the entirety of a the county pocket I don't really have the exact acreage of that but this would take a significant chunk out of that It's also the SC4 zoning would be uh, compatible with the adjoining road classifications. And as stated in the, once again, in the previous public hearing, that we generally do a, uh, a neighborhood plan with annexation requests. Uh, this annexation request is unique in <coughs> that the applicants at this point in time don't want to lay the foundation to dictate what the future developer may do there. They're more or less desiring to have a zone to allow that uh, southeast corner of 15th and 16th and Idaho <coughs> to transition appropriately, hence just the blanket SC4 zone. But the three that we have processed will, would be the crossings, Crown Point, and Mike Acres. The engineering division has commented and found that the project would not adversely impact the transportation system and both the Idaho Street and 16th Avenue are currently constructed and meet roadway standards. For domestic water, it's located adjacent to the properties on Idaho and 16th Street, and that the city has facilities to provide service to the proposed <coughs> annexation, and the pro proposed annexation and requested land use classification would not adversely impact the city's water system. And for wa water reclamation, the city has the available facilities to provide service to the proposed project. So as an update, if you've seen from the <coughs> Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, it was recommended approval with modifications of condition number one. Since the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, we have met with the applicant to look at that condition and come up with an agreement of the verbiage for that uh, condition. Uh, that condition is stated here is in condition number one and that prior to subdivision of land, 
the city's development review committee the DRC will initiate a smart code infill neighborhood plan for the area that involves or will affect the property owners and that the infill neighborhood will comply with smart code title 18 and on that note as you see here in red um, this isn't a, a final uh, conclusive determination from staff but presumably <coughs> Right at this location, the infrastructure doesn't really allow for an infill plan to really go into this area. So if at time we started getting a subdivision, we probably would look at what you see in red as an infill plan for that area to look at the uh, transportation connectivity and zoning that would be most appropriate for that area in entirety. So now I'd stand for any questions you have from me regarding this proposed annexation. Questions, John? See none, thank you. All right, thank you. Shannon. Thank you. Mr. Barry Rubin would like to <coughs> speak and is neutral. Good evening, Barry Rubin. <coughs> I'm not going to address any of the particulars of this proposal. It may be a very good idea or it may not. I, but I would just like to address this more from a systemic approach. When you initiate your deliberations and analysis, it might be beneficial to think about what the objective of this is or is this the objective in and of itself. This is pretty much similar to what I spoke about the last time I came up, which was also neutral, which I can't believe I did that as well, but oh well. You can't either, um, <clears throat> when you think about this, because something can be done, does that necessarily mean it should be done? And not just for this project, but for any project. Uh, on the face of it, this seems like a reasonable thing to do. I live not very far from here. One thing I would comment on from staff is that there was mention of it would not adversely affect transportation. Uh, if this does go to apartments and X number of units times two vehicles on Idaho Street at 8 or 9 in the morning or 4 or 5 or 6 in the evening, I can't see how that might in and of itself be beneficial to the transportation system and that goes for any development. The other thing is just general infrastructure considerations as a whole for the city. More people, more infrastructures, more schools, this, that, and the next thing. So it, it could be a good project. Uh, it could not. I don't know. Uh, but when you engage in your analysis and your deliberations, please take into account the long-term ramifications of this project uh, and see where that, where that leads us, especially impact on the tax base for the city and financial considerations. We know what more residential housing does to the city's tax base and the net impact on the taxpayers. Uh, commercial is good, residences maybe not. So when you uh, engage in your due deliberations, please take into account all these considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Appreciate it. That was it. Uh, uh, I will allow you if you take, is that all right, John? Sure. Quick second, fill out a form. Uh, grab a form, I'll have you give it to the clerk when you're it's right, right behind you. Yeah, it's right behind you. And you can come up and testify and just hand that to the clerk as you leave.
Come on up and just give your name to the record, please. Or name for the record, please. And you've got three minutes. Shelly, you want to reset that? Yes, my name is Dennis Brolick. I live at 917 East 12th Avenue. Um, I'm in the diamond part of the, um, I would believe that would be the uh, southeast corner. And the infrastructure, this is called like another pocket zone. And I was kind of in amazement why we jagged the road to align it for the quote, school crossings and stuff there. When in this area, we have a really poor infrastructure right now of the depth of the water system when they gave up Greens Ferry and Ross Point when they did the development stuff. My uh, water line is probably so shallow when it froze and destroyed my house five years ago and we're spent battling with both the city and my insurance company to cover it, my water meter froze. Now, when I talked to Hilly Kellogg many years ago, she wanted to dedicate that property to a park. She didn't mean to have the park across the street named in her name, but as you know, the congestion, I think law enforcement deals with it too, is at times Idaho Street looks like 405 and the 101 connecting. And we're now having a new project just down the street on 12th that's combining is just past um, Greens Ferry where they're building another housing project. And that's probably going to add maybe two to 300 cars in the area and homes for both the 12th and 16th Street uh, connections there. And one of the things is, is, is since we lived in the area, um, we tried to keep track of most of these mailings and stuff, and we never got a notice that they were going to build a housing project just down the street. And it's very hard right now to get any help from the city to fix the problems we've done over the years from pocket zoning. And I think the, the problem is, is as you go on the south and east on that corridor, most of us five or 600 homes that were pocket zoned many years ago have the really shallow Ross Point water system. And I, I think it'd be unfair to allow this project to even advance beyond the park until we fix the present infrastructure we have already there. And to just re, and realigning that road and not widening the 12th as a corridor then, if you're gonna add that many cars in, we don't have a uh, turning lane in the center like there is down further past Greens Ferry. So my objection is, is because I, I feel that this would add too much of the infrastructure stress already on the traffic of both Idaho and 12th and on 16th Street. And I believe some of the usage over the years of the five, some of the 500 homes that were in there, that's the, and you can look at an aerial of my property, all the kids come through and play in that park. We walk our dogs in that park and stuff. And I believe in the good faith of Hilly Kellogg when she first mentioned that, that she wanted that as kind of a treed park area. I think that's the way we should leave it. It would also relieve the stress and as a green area for the other homes that are going on down the street towards Greens Ferry and the, and the pocket zone. Because when I was first approached in 2008, they wanted to make a nursing home of 100 acres. And it would be sort of like what's next to Walmart. And I just kind of like gas then because of what it would do for the house that I have down on uh, American Drive. So again, I object to the project being an X at this time. Thank you very Appreciate much. It. Thank you. And uh, I didn't read it because I didn't have it, but he would be opposed. And that was all the testimony. Uh, would the applicant like to rebut? If they could put the uh, plat map up, maybe I can straighten out a couple things, if that's possible. Again, Randy Wells, P.O. Box 430, Athol, Idaho. Um, I just wanted to answer a couple things and maybe shed a little history here for everyone. Um, well, Miss Hilda, but if you go back in, yeah, that one right there. If you, if you can put that up. Yeah, I will. If you can go, uh, we do all miss Hilda, but if you go back in history, Hilda never owned that property except for, uh, and when I get there, if you notice where it says SC4, uh, you'll see the small rectangle, the two on the left. <coughs> Hilda owns the one, owned the one closest to the new road, and her sister Betty owned the other one and all of that labeled SC4. So it really wasn't Hilda's call to say what she would do with it. However, we wanted it to be a park also. I'd still love for the city to go ahead and, and work with us to make that happen. However, we <coughs> brought it to the city, and the city said they're parked out in that part of town. They've got more parks per capita than, than they need and that kind of stuff. It's still open and viable. If, if, uh, if Mr. Mayor, if you want to appoint a committee to, to uh, 
get that process working, we'll, we'll work with the city. It's not a donation because uh, it's, uh, this isn't Trump Plaza. This is, this is uh, Randy Wells living in Athol, Idaho. Uh, but however, the, the, the uh, concept of a park did come forward. Uh, it was talked about actually in more than probably several meetings. I had some with some of your council members also uh, to make that happen. And your park department came back and just said, we, we've got too many parks in that area per capita and we don't need any more. If it could happen, that'd be great. As far as traffic goes, I understand. Um, that's why I live in Athol. Um, the other side of the coin is parks, people drive to parks. So I'm not sure how they would get there other than driving their car. So even if it was a park, you'd still have traffic and it would still be, you know, uh, throughout the day and that kind of a deal. But I just wanted to clarify that the property that, that Hilda Kellogg owned on that was uh, the one rectangle spot. You can go back probably 50 years, 40 years anyway, uh, and the rest of it belonged to Betty. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. With that, I'll close the public hearing. Council deliberation. <laughs> Linda. I have several things. First of all, um, I would like to thank the three parties who did come together for this annexation uh, to be done together. We've tried for the 15 years I've been involved in city government to get neighbors together to do these infill projects and annex themselves as, as a group instead of a little pocket here and a little pocket there. As far as um, the gentleman that sounds like he lives in the county pocket, we're trying to have all of the county pocket that is in the city limits of Post Falls annex into the city. Um, they use city services, many of them, and we would like to see that, or I would like to see that. I guess I'll speak for myself. Secondly, um, the, the SC4 zoning is not residential zoning. It's mixed use zoning. So just um, to kind of address what Mr. Rubin said about having so much residential there just sort of a clarification um, on that point. So that I, would, I would be in favor of this. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Go ahead, Joe. I, I would be in favor of it uh, for all of the reasons that uh, Councillor Wilhelm just mentioned. And it would be, I, I was in some of those discussions <coughs> on that, being, you know, in a perfect world being parkland. And I can't remember exactly what we were hoping would be there but uh, yeah this is any time that we can reduce those n the number of county pockets that are right smack in the middle of the city is a good day so I would be in favor uh, you have a uh, I would also be in favor the, the SC4 zoning uh, seems to be the most appropriate for that area because it's right in the middle of town so there's mixed uses everywhere and being the the right wing curmudgeon I am, so I believe that people that have, have property should be able to do whatever they want with it. And, and that designation yeah, I've heard this give, gives them that opportunity. So I appreciate it. Uh, in terms of traffic, you know, th those are two major roads. And as we develop, as, as not we, as the city of Post Falls develops more and more to the downtown area right outside our building here, um, there's going to be more traffic coming to this area anyway. And they're going to come down Idaho. They're going to come down Spokane. Um, I like the conditions included in that and I think any motion that is made uh, should be assumed to include those commissions uh, conditions and I'll, I'll talk to council when it gets to that point um, but that's I think that's a good condition let's, let's take a look at what they're planning before the permits are issued just to make sure that everything is is all kosher so to speak but um, I think it's by far the best we can do for that area um, is to allow this type of mixed-use development thank you Alan, any comment? Uh, the only comment I have was to address what uh, Mr. Rubin mentioned about the more the, the higher expense for taxpayers when it comes to rooftops. This is the one exception to that. When it's already infilled, it's already surrounded by city. This is when it's cheaper actually to turn them into rooftops than leave it as county because we get the tax benefit from that. So uh, other than that, I think it's a good project and I agree with the SC4. Any <clears throat> well, I'm not saying I wouldn't vote for this SC4, but I would rather see SC3 there. If they had SC3, they could still have, they wouldn't be able to do anything they wanted to do with it like SC4. 
They still have could have a restaurant, <coughs> offices, uh, retail, deli, bed and breakfast. They could still have a lot of those things. They just wouldn't be open to anything that they wanted to do. And boy, if you leave it up to anything they want to do, you don't know what's going to be in there. So I would be much more open to FC3. Skip. Um, I, I actually agree with Betty on the SV3, but I think everybody else is comfortable with the SV4. Uh, for people brought up the, the travel and the, the trips per day, if we build houses there or we build whatever. Actually, if we stop and think about it and we put a restaurant there, we put an office building there, instead of driving to the other side of town, people in that part of town get to drive three or four blocks and they're done. Uh, there's a good example out in uh, Hayden Lake uh, where they put in a very large development on the corner of it they put local commercial so people can go to the gym without driving to the other side of town they can go to the dentist I believe it's a dentist that's located there so there's advantages the mixed use actually in many ways can reduce the amount of traffic that goes through a given intersection or at least the uh, up and down Idaho's the full length of it so I think it's a, a real good uh, use for it I think a little less uh, density of an R of the SV SC three would be better but I'll still support the four I'd make a motion I would move to approve the Garrett Adams Kassoon annexation file number a-14-03 with SC4 zone with a condition number one set forth by the city second motion second for the discussion Clerk, please take the roll both Aye. Malloy? Aye. Henderson? Aye. His song? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passes. Uh, we had two conditions. That's what my yeah. question was. I wanted uh, to make I clear. was looking to John to see if that covered that. They included the first condition. Uh, do we need to include the second Yeah, the well? second condition is like a boiler type condition that runs with almost any annexation that we've processed that governs the annexation agreement and the master development agreement. To accompany future processing of do you want that included in the motion yes i do yes and okay, before so you amended. before you modify um just to be clear the condition that is being proposed to be included would be as modified by mr manley previously not as drafted in the staff report is that correct i just want to make it clear for me okay is that i don't know is that what you intended yeah the conditions that he put up on the screen it would be as modified right. from okay. the Planning and Zoning Commission. Okay, I'll amend my motion to include that. Second. Motion second. And uh, further discussion? And although we voted, let's vote on the amended uh, motion, please. Clerk, click the roll. Wilhelm? Aye. Hissong? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passed. Thank you. Um, I apologize. I, I was thinking the same thing you did, and I should have stopped before we voted the first time. So. Thank you very much for all who participated. Next public hearing is the public hearing for the adoption of the 2012 International Residential Code, International Energy Conservation Code, International Mechanical Code, and the International Fuel Gas Code with amendments. And I believe we've got Harmony Connolly Oaks presenting, and I don't know if we've ever had you present before. Welcome. So. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Harmony Oaks Building Division. This public hearing is for the adoption of the 2012 International Residential Code, Energy Conservation Code, Mechanical Code, and the International Field Gas Code. Excuse me one just minute. stated, yes. I opened the public hearing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you don't have to repeat yourself. <laughs> okay. Any amendments to the codes are required to be put forth for public comments prior to adoption. Up until this point, there have not been any comments submitted to our office. As you know, the City of Post Falls is a jurisdiction that has a building inspection program which is required to adopt by ordinance such codes as mandated by the state of Idaho. There is no fiscal impact on the city. There are no significant changes to the energy conservation, mechanical, and the fuel gas codes. These are mostly language clarifications, general housekeeping. Um, the residential code has had some changes. Um, a few examples, um, without going through the entire book, <coughs> excuse me, is the code is more specific to uh, hazardous locations for safety glazing of windows, stairways, landings, that kind of stuff. Um, flagpoles for residences have been added to the um, exempt from a permit section. So now residences can put up flagpoles without a permit. Wall bracing has been simplified, um, which is much more builder contractor friendly for everyone involved. Um, many of our neighboring jur jurisdictions have already or are in the process of adopting these 2012 codes. 
Um, if the council approves this evening, the ordinance would be adopted under ordinance and resolutions later on within the agenda. And at this point, I will do my best to answer any questions you might have. Any questions of Harmony? Thank you very much. Welcome. And you Thank would you. be the app, the city would be the applicant. Correct. So we're not, I would assume we have no further staff report. Correct. Do we have anyone wishing to testify? So I'm sure you're not going to rebut yourself. No, I'm not. I will close the public hearing and congratulate you on having one of the shortest public hearings we've had. Thank Good you. job. <laughs> Council deliberation. I'd make a motion. Make I'd move to adopt the 2012 International Residential Code, International Mechanical Code, and the International Fuel Gas Code with amendments. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Clerk, please take the roll. Wilhelm? Aye. <coughs> Hissong? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, unfinished business. We have none. And citizens' issues is next. This section of the agenda is reserved for citizens wishing to address a council regarding a city-related issue that is not on the agenda. Chief Merritt. Thanks very much, uh, Mayor and Council Warren Merritt, for the record. Um, just a couple things here. Uh, actually, three things now. One, I'm glad the AC is working. It's a lot cooler than two weeks ago. <laughs> Appreciate that very much. Uh, and then the second item is that it's getting really dry out there, so it's my chance to really get before the Council and the audience and, and the citizens, citizens that are watching and, and just be careful with your, uh, with your fires. And then the third thing I want to do is just talk about the value, uh, the value of a smoke detector in the home. Um, we experienced our second fatality this year in the Post Falls community, and uh, just about a month ago. And in that residence, there was not a working smoke detector, so we're asking people to take the time uh, to be sure that one's there, that it's working, that it's appropriately installed in the home, and that it's tested once in a while. And there needs to be one on, on each floor, uh, not in the kitchen. It's, it's not a uh, timer. And, uh, <laughs> We'd also like to ask people to have them outside of their resident or outside of the hallway, um, outside their bedroom. So um, we haven't had two fatalities uh, that, that I could find since the early 90s here in the Post Falls community. So it's just really an opportunity for us to pass on a safety message and urge everyone to, um, to uh, take the um, pertinent sort of precautions in protecting uh, themselves and, and their families. So thanks very much for your thanks, time. Thanks, Chief. Thank Appreciate it. Anyone else? Seeing none. New business. This is an interesting one, robot regulation. Huh. Mr. Malloy had brought this forth for consideration and there was a video that we contemplated watching but uh, from what I heard from staff, uh, the video didn't tend to add a lot to uh, the topic itself and so Mr. Malloy said he would make a brief introduction of why we were even considering this. If you uh, read the paper this morning, you would see that uh, Coeur d'Alene, City of Coeur d'Alene is also considering an ordinance in this regard, so Joe? And the reason we don't have the, uh, the person that brought this to me, his name's Nick Smoot, uh, is because he's presenting at the Coeur <coughs> City Council right now. Otherwise, he uh, couldn't be two places at once. Uh, so he came to me a few weeks ago. Uh, it's probably been longer ago than that with an idea that, uh, that is twofold. Um, one is that there are a lot of, uh, lots, of, lots of controversy going on lately in, in a lot of cities, municipalities, states, and so forth uh, about uh, you know, those camera drones that are flying around and some things like that. <coughs> Lawsuits are popping up. And, and in general, as technology advances, it seems that you know, city ordinances and laws are always a step behind. Um, it makes things tough on, on police department staff, uh, legal staff, and so forth to try to figure out how to deal with technologies as they develop. So uh, I thought it was a pretty smart idea in the case of, of robotics, which is a vastly growing industry. Everybody's seen Google's investments buying up every robotics company in the world, basically. Um, and Boston Technology, some of these things are getting very autonomous um, and very quickly. Uh, so idea number one behind having some kind of ordinance to regulate the interaction between autonomous robots and people, uh, while it's a bit ahead of its time and unrealistic at this point, uh, <coughs> is going to be realistic pretty quick. And so uh, get ahead of the technology, at least have a base work, a framework to, to guide off of when these things start popping up, and uh, it can be modified later. Um, some of the uh, platform, I guess, that went behind uh, the suggestions that I think most of us have seen, I think uh, legal staff seen it, uh, administrator, the mayor. Uh, was based off of uh, pet ordinances, you know, pets wandering around, what, what, uh, what are they allowed to do, not to do, you know, and obviously that all gets passed back to the owner, which is the same onus of an owner of a robot who is operating autonomous, autonomously in public property. Um, so at least have some kind of framework to start with when these things start popping up. 
uh, option, uh, the second aspect of this is, is honestly kind of marketing. Um, there is no city in the country and that we know of in the world yet that has any kind of ordinance to regulate such activity. Um, so it would be a fairly newsworthy event if Coeur d'Alene, Post Falls, the North Idaho region are the first to be forward thinking and have some kind of framework to allow these things. Uh, the idea being getting some coverage and getting the eye of some technology companies, um, some of which are already kind of in, you know, looking at this area as a place to move, um, but there are lots of places to go. Silicon Valley, we've got to compete with uh, Seattle. Um, but really to sell the whole North Idaho area on um, being kind of a, a new hub of, of the robotics and technology industries. Uh, the Coeur d'Alene and Post Falls in that instance uh, seems to be kind of a, a match made in heaven in that you know, Coeur d'Alene, you got the lake, you got the resort, uh, the, the kind of panache um, that sells really well to corporate headquarters, uh, but there's not a lot of room uh, for industry there. Uh, Post Falls right next door, we've got the infrastructure. Uh, we just discussed in our workshop that you know heavy industry is actually less expensive to put into, uh, or light and heavy industry, to put into Post Falls. And the two communities, uh, communities together, marketing, could really you know, do a one-two punch to, to attract some of these businesses here. Uh, Nick and some of his associates are already planning on uh, some you know, time-sharing offices in Coeur d'Alene, that sort of thing, for startups. Um, and as this thing grows, uh, with Post Falls involved, to be able to attract larger, uh, more industrial-type firms, um, I think would be a good thing. Uh, step one is to, is to let the world know we're here. And so uh, to be ahead of the technology and to be forward-thinking, um, with this type of ordinance, uh, it, I think would be a benefit, and he thinks it would also be a benefit of this area. So that's, that's the brief rundown. Thanks, John. I know staff met with legal, uh, staff met with legal uh, this afternoon and reviewed the, uh, I think it was a proposed ordinance that was being considered. <coughs> there were several questions, concerns, et cetera, that I think led staff to believe and, and legal to believe that it's we're not ready to pass the ordinance yet, but it's to get it in front of us and uh, for discussion purposes, et cetera. So that was kind of a brief background on that. Sure. Yeah, I did read the aforementioned article in the press today uh, regarding what was being presented to Coeur d'Alene. And I'm not making that leap between how creating regulation is going to attract an industry that yeah I just I can't make that leap of you know Idaho is kind of the place where we like to we have limited regulation on things um, it, you know and and I know last year because I took photos of the little Google Street View car that went all around town and this would be something obviously I don't think they'd be able to do um, mind based only on the article that I read today in the Coeur d'Alene press but yeah so I, I think it's it's it bears a conversation, but I'm not seeing where that would be necessarily a positive thing for economic development. Mr. I, I would just, <coughs> um, the, the proposed ordinance, uh, Council Member Thorson is correct. It wouldn't be allowed under the existing ordinance. Google Street the, 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 the photographs. The photographs. photographs, yeah. Correct. So, skip. Doesn't the state of Idaho already regulate these? If they do, I'm not familiar with it, Council Member. I, that doesn't mean they don't. There's many, many things, as being married has taught me, that I do not know about that exist. So, but we're not going on that other topic. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I don't see this as a city ordinance issue. It's it's uh, there's other ones where cities choose to do what I see as a state job, not ours. If they choose not to do it, then down the road maybe we need to do it. But something like this, I don't see it being pocketed by one or two cities. And pretty soon we got a, a, a quilt going here with a thousand different ordinances and a thousand towns in the same state. This is a state issue, if it is anybody's issue. And I wouldn't support anything locally on it. During our I agree. Carrie, I agree. I don't see the leap to get from putting in a restrictive ordinance to attracting the people that build the thing we just restricted. So. During our staff discussion, we had discussed flipping it from an ordinance to a proclamation to show support for such industry within the um, city of Post Falls. Mm -hmm. And so that's a possible discussion um, versus an ordinance. And just sort of for, and I know that the mayor knows this, but Jobs Plus is working with some robotic companies too. So there are people like Joe says looking at this area. Um, 
we, uh, I think we should welcome them with open arms. So I think a proclamation is a really, really good idea. Biddy, any I would support them coming for sure. Biddy, any comments? No, I was just going to say the proclamation is much better than if, if you're only going to use the word pro proclamation, that makes a big difference. I forgot for some clarification. I, I was going to try to pull up. It's not in the uh, packet, so I was going to try to pull it up from my email of what some of the suggested uh, regulations were, but it's not hooked up to the internet here. Uh, but they're pretty simple things, you know, is uh, like compared to a leash law with a dog, you know, can a dog be in public with or without a leash, yes or no? Uh, you know, is an autonomous boat without an operator allowed to be on the river, yes or no? Um, and in what instances is it allowed to be on the river? You know, does it have to follow the same laws as humans do? And in this case, the proposed is, yeah, it has to follow the same laws as humans do. It's not really restrictive, it's just more clarifying. You know, is is a person allowed to you know, take photographs into somebody's window? No, this clarifies that a robot also is not. Um, that sort of thing. So it's not really restricting anybody's ability to manufacture, anybody's ability to own. It's just to clarify some issues that may arise that, okay, is considering that there's nothing operating this thing, wh what can it do? And so it's, it's uh, like I said, kind of ahead of its time a bit because we don't really know what autonomous robots in public spaces are going to look like quite yet. Uh, we're starting to get an idea. Uh, but it'll allow a framework to, okay, so now there's a boat operating itself in the river. Uh, how is this, how is it applicable by law? And that's, that's what this is intending to clarify. It's not really a, a, a regulation or a restriction per se. Gary? Yeah. The, is it the FAA, the, the aviation, um, they're already dealing with right now laws restricting the drone cameras. Uh, the news business is already dealing with that issue. And I'm thinking also the other use right now of drone cameras, so the robotic cameras, um, tourism and real estate. Okay, so if I have a house and I, and I want my realtor to get an aerial view of it because it's just so awesome, they're probably going to get a picture or even a street view, they're probably going to get a picture of the neighbors or the neighborhood you know so there's you know there's a whole nether thing if you have to have uh written permission from a neighbor but anyways it's it is so new you're absolutely right i don't know how we can get out in front of something that we don't even know all the ramifications that there will be ellen you have any comments this is one of those things that joe and i agree on i uh I don't think that we need to build it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing the date down right now. It's scary. I think that uh, I think it's not a bad idea to be kind of out in front of this thing. And I don't I don't I like the proclamation idea more than a regulation. I think regulation is a bad way to th you know think of things. But I don't think there's anything wrong with having the dialogue. And I'm glad you brought it forward because it is something that's that's starting to attach itself to our community. Somebody flew a drone through the fireworks display in Coeur d'Alene. So it's happening. And I don't think there's anything wrong with at least starting to have the dialogue and, you know, getting counsel and the police department and the fire department and everybody else involved with what does this mean? What does this mean to us? And uh, I don't know if it's going to be something that's going to be a leader in attracting business, but if it is, it is. So I'm with you, Joe. Let's go ahead and see what this, where this takes us. Keep our eye on it. No, I think the main the main reason when Joe and I were talking about it, I, you know, I too don't necessarily like the thought that we're being restrictive or, or uh, regulating at this point because we don't know what it is. But I do like the fact that we want to get something out to let people know that we're aware of it and that we would welcome the industry with open arms. So, uh, I do appreciate you bringing it up for discussion purposes. So, Council, how do you how do you want to act? You want to take any action on this? You want to direct staff to come up with a proclamation? What's your preference? Proclamation. Proclamation. Sure. I'd support a proclamation. Yeah. What are you going to proclaim? That we right. are open for business in Post yes. Falls? That's pretty obvious gotcha. already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let staff decide that. I would say yeah. no action at this point in time. Yeah. I, th I just think that it's, it's nice to have it brought forward. Quite frankly, when I first saw it on the uh, the agenda, I had no idea what you were talking about. I didn't have, I, just, I had no clue, but well, now I've got more, much more of a clue about it. And I think that just that awareness alone is, is valuable. So, and I guess just the last thing to say on that is the, uh, the, the ordinance proposed is not 
particularly restrictive. When we're talking about drones being flying, flown over by a real estate agent, all that stuff is somebody operating by a remote control. And all of that's pretty well, I mean, even, even though there's a person operating it, it's still a fuzzy area of law. And so to, to, not, to wait until, okay, now we got a drone that's operating completely autonomously. Um, there's no person with remote control to even go back to. Um, you know, a basic framework for that probably wouldn't hurt. And from a marketing standpoint, uh, there's no points for second place. If another, if another city uh, passes an ordinance like this, and Coeur d'Alene, from talking to, to them, sounds like they're, go they're going to. Um, they get to be number one, they get all the press, and we have a proclamation saying, hey, we like business. But it uh, could be an opportunity missed. Uh, maybe it's a pointless opportunity, but yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. I think it'll get some press, and I think it'll, be, it'll show us as, as being forward thinking anyway. We've got two topics. We've got uh, do nothing. We've got well, actually three. We've got ordinance or regulate uh, resolution. And we've got uh, proclamation. I think we all decided the proclamation would be much better than the regulation. No, not down here. We didn't. Well, except I say do nothing. Do nothing. I say ordinance. Carrie, I'm going to go on the do nothing because I'm not ready, nor do I think that we are. When I say we. Uh, I don't think we're ready to create an ordinance, and I think a proclamation it, for a specific industry. We welcome industry here, so I'm so going we have to two do nothing. Do nothing's ordinance. But proclamation. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to go with those two because I think, to some degree, we're a solution looking for a problem. So and let's do nothing. Do nothing, Linda. I'm going to go with the do nothing also after. So we'll do nothing at this point. Yeah. But uh, Joe, thanks for bringing it up for discussion. We'll follow Coeur d'Alene, see what they do, and uh, we can always revisit it in the yeah. future. So, next item: Jack event catering permit. I think we had a bit of a miss, or something was not included in the when we addressed this a few weeks ago, and hopefully this will resolve. No, this is new. This so is, we yeah. did the, the... No, I know it's new, but I mean, this was something else that had come up. I think we oh, opened right. a can of worms last week is yes. what we did. Yes. It's hot. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. As I was uh, here a couple of weeks ago for the uh, chamber requesting a catering permit, now we have a catering permit from the Jack. They're wanting to um, uh, serve some alcohol at an event. And as you know, Title 23 does not allow for a licensee to be within 300 feet of a church. Uh, Cynthia Keck is here tonight representing the Jack and she has visited with the uh, Presbyterian Church here, the pastor there, and they have no problem with uh, this being approved. So we're here tonight to, uh, to seek your um, um, approval to allow for them to have a catering permit within 300 feet of a church. Having said that, my recommendation would be if you approve it that we do the same thing we did with the, uh, the chamber, that we uh, approve it ongoing and, unless it's revoked by you at a later time. That's why I say it was something that we hadn't thought of last time. We're going to fix it. So I appreciate your input. Discussion. So do you need a motion? Yes. We, uh, the law allows or requires the council to make an exception to that. So we would need the council to approve that. So moved. A motion. Second. Second. Further discussion? Clerk, please take the roll. Thorson. Aye. Wolf. Aye. Malloy. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Hissan. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, folks. Uh, ordinances and resolution. First ordinance, 2012 International Residential Code et al. Move to place the ordinance 2012 International Residential Code, International Mechanical Code, and the International Fuel Code with amendments on its first and only reading by title only while under suspension of the rules. Second. Motion second for discussion. <laughs> Can Clerk, please, please take the roll. Suspense. Hissong. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Henderson. Aye. Wolf. Aye. Loy. Aye. Thorson. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Cafferty. I'm trying to decide if I can read it better by making it bigger on the screen or if putting my glasses on reading the paper <laughs> is easier. I think I'm going with the paper. Thank you for indulging me. An ordinance of the City of Post Falls, a municipal corporation of the state of Idaho, amending section 15.04.010 of the Post Falls City Code to adopt the 2012 International Residential Code with revisions adopted by the state 
adopting the supplements and adopting additional amendments amending section 15.48.010 to adopt the 2012 International Energy Conservation Code as amended by the state. Amending section 15.52.010 to adopt the 2012 International Mechanical and Fuel Gas Codes, providing severability, providing repeal of conflicting ordinances, and providing an effective date. Move to approve the ordinance 2012 <coughs> International Residential Code, International Mechanical Code, and the International Fuel Code with amendments and to direct the clerk to assign the appropriate number and that it be published by summary only. Second. <laughs> Motion to very quick second. <laughs> Further discussion? Uh, yes. Clerk, <laughs> please take the roll. Did you want to get the record? Aye. Wilk. Aye. Thorson. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Hisson. Aye. Henderson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Next ordinance is Robert's first edition right of way vacation. Move to place the ordinance on the Robert's first edition file number V-14-01 on its first and only reading by title only while under suspension of the rules. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? <clears throat> Please take the roll. Thorson. Aye. Wolf. Aye. Loy. Aye. Henderson. Aye. Hisong. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Mr. Caffrey. An ordinance of the City of Post Falls, a municipal corporation of Idaho, providing for the vacation of a portion of Catherine Street and 17th Avenue right of way in section 34, Township 51 North, Range 5 West, Boise Meridian, described herein, providing for disposition of the vacated right of way as described herein, providing an effective date and providing for other matters properly relating thereto. Move to approve the ordinance, Robert's first edition right away of vacation, file number V14-01, to direct the clerk to assign the appropriate number and that it be published by summary only. Second. Motion to second. Further discussion? Please take the roll. Wilson. <coughs> Aye. Hissong. Aye. Henderson. Aye. Malloy. Aye. Wolf. I'm always in favor of a vacation, so <laughs> I'll go aye, too. Thorson. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next, on my, next item is resolution on the preliminary budget. And before, I just wanted to mention this resolution, because we kind of go through this every year, and I know Alan's new, allows Jason to put in the legal notice into the press for the public hearing that will come forward. Currently, the proposed budget that will come forward to council will not include any type of property tax increase. So this would set the revenues and allow for us to move forward with um, continuing. Jason and I pretty much have the recommended budget together, but we're finalizing it and we'll get you the copies soon prior to the public hearing. Thanks, Shelley. Thank you. Move to approve the resolution preliminary budget. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? Clerk, please take the roll. Thorson. Aye. Wolf. Aye. Malloy. Aye. Henderson. Aye. Hisson. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. We're almost through. Next item, police update. Chief is going to introduce Captain Knight. Or do you want to just have Captain Pat Knight come forward? I'll just introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to speak here tonight about the uh, recent trip to the FBI Academy or the National Academy. Also want to not just thank you for your support, but thank the city administrator and the chief for, as well for allowing me to, uh, to miss work for a while, go back and attend the academy, which, which is uh, certainly a, a huge accomplishment. I, I really enjoyed the experience and, and uh, share some of that with you here tonight. I do have to make a disclaimer before we start. Um, as I was putting this uh, uh, PowerPoint together, sent it off to Kit this morning, I thought to myself, boy, it sure looks like I was on vacation for 10 weeks. <laughs> but I take a lot of pictures. I took advantage of the weekends, and uh, my family came out when after graduation. We spent about 11 days uh, traveling up and down the coast, so just to, just to take in all the history back there was just uh, was just awesome. So um, I'll start with just kind of the selection process itself. Uh, how that works is uh, you basically log into Virtual Academy through the FBI Virtual Academy, print out a, uh, an application process, you fill that out, um, you send that off to your chapter, which for us is the Idaho and Montana chapter of the FBI to get approval to attend the, the National Academy. When that comes back, it has to be signed off by your agency head, department head, which then gets shipped off to the 
uh, FBI office down in Salt Lake City, and you get established, basically established to put on a list, and that list can be several years long. I think I was on it probably four or five years before uh, the, the selection process really started to, to move forward. Uh, they notified me, said I was going in 2017, then uh, about a, six months later, I think it was, Chief, they said going in 2015, and then they called back in a couple weeks and said, can you leave in April? So we, we really kind of uh, sped through that process, but uh, it is a lengthy process to get going on that. Uh, only about 2% of all law enforcement officers ever get uh, selected to go to the FBI National Academy. I am proud to, uh, to claim that Post Falls City here at the police department right now, we have four people who have actually graduated that academy. So um, I think that's, that speaks wonders for the city. So um, again, the, the chosen by the Idle Montana chapter. And uh, for successful completion of the program, you get 17 college credits in your 10-week work program down there from the University of Virginia. Um, it's kind of a layout of the academy there. That's uh, the middle board. Uh, the FBI National Academy, kind of what it is in a nutshell, uh, without boring you by PowerPoint, it's professional development for law enforcement leaders worldwide. Uh, we had 220 people in our class. Uh, of those 220 people, there were 46 states represented in 17 countries. So uh, we had all kinds of, of folks that attended that. So uh, there's kind of a layout of the campus itself. Uh, just threw that in there. Uh, 255th session reloaded. Uh, the reason I say reloaded is uh, the, uh, the FBI director himself uh, said, well, we made history. We're the, the, this is the class that was sent home last year during the furlough. Uh, when the FBI or the government shut down, this class had just started. They were two weeks into it, and were sent home. So 180 of the students actually returned with a 255th, and uh, 40 of us were new. Uh, that did not go down last year. So they kind of split the class up, sent, sent some last time uh, to try and make that up. Um, the classes that I took on, this is a lot like going to college. Uh, you log on, you take the courses you want, and the first day you get there, you kind of uh, uh, go through those courses and make sure it is what you want to take. So uh, managing death investigations, uh, excellent class. Uh, co computer crimes for police supervisors, as you know, that's really where it's going in law enforcement is computers. Uh, so you've got to keep up with technology. Psychopathological behaviors and violent offenders was a phenomenal class and really getting to, to learn the ins and outs of, of why people do what they do. Um, Behavior-based investigative strategies for violent crime, leadership ethics, decision-making, and of course everyone has to take physical fitness in law enforcement. So uh, those are kind of the courses you take. How it's set up is Monday, Tuesday, you're in, you're in class. Uh, Wednesday is kind of an enrichment and challenge day. They always have a physical fitness challenge every Wednesday. Um, and then you have uh, enrichment speakers that evening that's, that come in to talk that are phenomenal speakers. So <clears throat> dorm life, uh, tough to get used to. Uh, it wasn't so hard when I was in the Marine Corps. It wasn't so hard going to the police academy when you have a family and you go back to living with a roommate and you share a bathroom with four other guys. It, uh, it really is tough. You, first day, you really got to schedule uh, when you're going to take a shower and that kind of thing. So that was a rack we lived in. That was a little cubicle I, I sat and typed many, many papers at. It's like, uh, as I said, going to college, you're typing midterm papers, you're, uh, you're taking tests, weekly exams, um, and you're taking finals. So a lot of time spent in the dorm. The FBI uh, mission statement, a lot like most, most agencies are very rich in tradition, that everywhere you go, you're going to see up and down the hallways the FBI's uh, mission statement, their core values. So a lot like we have here at the city. You see it in City Hall, you see it down to the police department. <clears throat> I found out why the FBI is so smart. Uh, they have a three-story library. However, uh, about five weeks into it, I asked one of the directors, I said, where is everybody? I never, it's always empty. So I'm still baffled as to how they got so smart because they're never in the library. But <laughs> the library is beautiful. <laughs> um, any kind of book, any kind of video, any kind of computer you can think of are, are, are there. So uh, we did spend a lot of time in there doing a lot of research. Uh, the director on graduation day called us the cursed. And the reason they did that, it seemed to be everything went wrong with our class. Um, again, like I said, 100, 180 returning, 40 were new. Power outages were, were weekly with us. For whatever reason, big storms would happen. You'd hear people yelling down the hallway because their rooms are flooding. Um, the windows would leak. So. Um, it was, it was a little comical there. The water outages there, that, that's, in all honesty, we uh, went without hot water for three days at a time, I think twice when we were there. So you like cold waters and showers. And <clears throat> um, a little embarrassing, were the firefighters still here? Yeah, we were saved. Uh, a few of our guys were saved by our firemen. Uh, when the power outages went out, they were stuck in an elevator for a couple hours. So the fire department had to come and save them. They were a little embarrassed by that. But <laughs> it seemed to be everything was re... Uh, it, when we got down there after the furlough happened, it, it, a lot of construction was going on. So you'll see in some of the photos I got here that you, when you head down there, you got all these uh, expectations of the J. Edgar Hoover building and wanting to see what it really looked like. And you'll see some of the pictures as we arrived. But it seemed to be everything was closed off for us. They opened it up about two weeks before we graduated. Um, but. That's just how it was. Eating in a trailer, everything was a portable. We had a portable trailer for us at the time. Uh, missing buses, we'd go out to go on a field trip. They'd say a mandatory field trip Saturday. We'd stand there for an hour and a half and no one scheduled the bus. 
So just some of those things that it just seemed to be we were the class that was cursed and no one else had these issues. So, but it still was a great time. Uh, construction in all directions. This is day one when we got there. Uh, you're looking out the windows, looking at your uh, barracks and uh, everything seemed to be under construction. But I want to make, I'm not, I'm not here to complain. I'm here to say that it wasn't all bad. The weekends you spent, uh, what, what I spent anyways, taking in the Civil War battlefields, those types of things. Had a couple of guys that uh, I really got along well with and we traveled every weekend and, and saw some of the sites. You'd find us at the Orioles and Nationals games every weekend. And I'll spin through some of these real, real quick so we can get everyone out here. But uh, Washington, D.C., um, if you've never been to the Cherry Blossom Festival, uh, the crowd on the right, that was in every direction. Uh, everyone's there to see the, the trees and the Japanese, that, uh, you know, the story behind those. So um, I, I said, hey, you guys got to come to North Idaho sometime. He's just looking at trees and all these kind of people are here. But <laughs> it, uh, it, was, it was a neat event. Some of the attractions that you went up in, obviously, if you've never been to D.C. and the monuments, um, just some neat, neat history back there to, to, to go through. Um, Councilman Hissong, you'd love the Marine Corps Museum. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but probably the best museum I've ever had a chance to go to. I know the chief told me uh, about it when he went, and uh, it was it, we spent about four hours in there, my family and I, and we still didn't see it all. So it was really, really neat experiences. New York City, we, uh, we got along well with one of the guys who ended up being a, uh, an attorney on the 70, 75th floor there. He took us up there, and uh, we spent about three hours up in his offices just looking at the view uh, of New York City. So it was a outstanding. That's the family and I at the 9-1-1 Memorial. It just opened about three weeks before uh, they came down. Uh, I'm sorry, three weeks before we got down there. Uh, the museum opened up. Uh, the picture on the right that I took is of Vincent, um, I want to say it's Gianola. Um, he was my roommate's cousin. Uh, he was with a fifth ladder division over in New York City when 9-11 when hit. It was, it was his first cousin. They were very close and uh, it was his 40th birthday that morning. He was just getting off shift and uh, made a phone call home. His kids were waiting for him to come home and spend his birthday with him, and uh, they never found him. He never returned. So we, they have a wall there that you can actually punch someone's name in there, and they give the story about the person. So uh, it, was, it was very, very touching, so it was neat. <clears throat> but the 9-11 memorial was just outstanding. Arlington uh, National uh, Changing of the Guard to Arlington Cemetery was very, uh, very neat. They did find a horse that was big enough for me. I think it was a Clydesdale, but they told me it wasn't. <laughs> the only horse I could get on my feet didn't drag. So uh, we did Gettysburg by horseback. But it, it's all uh, narrated as you walk through the battlefields. It was just some neat, neat experiences. But um, Law Enforcement Week, we were there in May, so uh, Law Enforcement Week is very, uh, very emotional as well. Um, we got to go down to the wall down in Washington, D.C., uh, the Memorial Wall, uh, the Fallen Officer Wall. And then that evening, they had the Thin Blue Line uh, presentation, which is very touching. And I, while I was there, I wanted, I made it a point to get down to Linda Huff's memorial as well, down to see her on the wall. And uh, so took a picture of that there. <clears throat> Cops Kids Day, uh, if you're there in the spring, I think Chief was there in the spring as well, uh, you get to spend a day with survivors of uh, their family members. One of their family members or both were killed in the line of duty, and these are the surviving kids. <coughs> they get to come spend the day with you. So some of the stories that they um, tell you and, and things that they've challenged, they've encountered, um, it really was a, an excellent day uh, to go out and have fun with these kids. Uh, treat them to lunch, spend the day with them, uh, and they left signs before they left on, you know, how thankful they were for everything. But uh, it was just, these, these are days that are very, very emotional, and it was just so rewarding to do. A lot of the local history there, uh, Mary Washington's house in Fredericksburg. Um, again, this was a, a hike out through the Battle of the Woods. Uh, a buddy of mine says, hey, look out but, you know, behind you, and I turned around, and the snake was behind me. So stuff I just don't normally see here, I guess. But A um, couple of the challenges we did. Um, one is the, uh, the Yellow Brick Road Challenge. That's a little over six mile um, challenge on week 10. It's through the Marine Corps base. Uh, it's back through the woods. There's 20 obstacles involved um, in that 6.2, 6.3 6 miles, and most of them are ropes courses. And that's a yellow brick roach challenge and, and yellow brick challenge. As you complete that, you leave with the yellow brick. The other challenge they offered to you when you're there is a blue brick challenge. It's a 34-mile swim, accumulative while you're there. Um, so you try to get in the pool every morning, every night if you want to do it. Uh, I think about a quarter of our class completed it, but that was something that, uh, that I found um, I did anyway, but it was uh, took me about five and a half weeks to get through it, but it was it was a challenge. Um, and we did have to work too. I want to make sure this wasn't just a vacation. <laughs> uh, you were in class every day. You had to present PowerPoint presentations to students. Uh, you had to, like I said, midterms, there was finals. Uh, this class here is a, uh, one of our um, instructions were to, to bring a course or a, a, a case to the class that may not have been solved that you might, might want some help on. And this is one of our about nine and a half, 10 year old case now 
and uh, took it to the to the class. Got some great ideas on, on things that we haven't tried yet. So when I got back, I wanted to get with Greg and, and work on some of those things. But so it really was uh, it was beneficial for some of those courses uh, to get the experience from the other folks in the room. And you have law enforcement agents all over the world there. Uh, as I said, the guest speakers here. The gentleman speaking here was in the, the movie Black Hawk Down. He was the actual pilot that was that lived through that. Um, he came and spoke one night for a couple hours. Uh, most of these are all success stories and, and survivor stories of people that just come to talk to you and, and really inspire you. So it really is something to, to, ha to look forward to every Wednesday evening. And a big part of the academy there is the contacts you make, the law enforcement professional contacts you make. I'm in, I'm in touch with these folks. I've been back uh, three or four weeks now and uh, have emailed probably daily with, with most of these guys. New York City on the left, Kentucky, Cleveland, these guys that uh, really um, anything they want we, you know, we, we need, we correspond with each other. Two of them are already looking at our uh, chaplaincy program because they've got them back there, but they're just not running the right way they feel. Uh, they've already taken some packets from us and they're, they're, we, we learn from each other. But it, uh, the contacts are just a huge part of that academy. And of course, my favorite day, the day you come home to your family. So um, in a nutshell, that was it. I just want to get through it, give you an idea of what it was about. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of leadership training, a lot of ethics training um, and things of that nature. So. Pat, thank you. Thank You've you. got that uh, was great. Thank you. Congratulations. That's a huge commitment on your part and your family's part, and we appreciate and thank you for your dedication. Thanks, Representative. 34 miles is pretty awesome. <laughs> I must be getting old, but I remember when Captain McLean gave the same, uh, gave a similar report, so. I've been here a while, I guess. But we were more amazed that he was able to complete the yellow brick road than with Pat. <laughs> That's what I remember about that was the yellow brick road. So, thank you, Pat. Dave. You. Mr. Mayor, Council, I'm before you tonight as part of a council request that was triggered due to a letter to the editor that was published this week. Um, I guess chastising me in the city for not selling season boat passes. Uh, this intent to suspend it for the summer was part was mentioned as part of the Avista workshop when we looked at the limited um, parking there. To put in perspective, we currently have 44 boat spaces available. We did pick up a few with some adjustments Avista made, but still 44 is about half of what, of what we normally have. Um, last year we sold 75 season boat passes, and to date I've had two complaints come to me about it. One of them was from the gentleman who wrote the letter. So I'm open to any questions. And Dave, you mentioned last year that when we did sell season passes, you received six complaints oh. regarding the season passes themselves. Well, so we received more complaints when we were selling them than we have received yeah. by not selling. That was actually for the 4th of July. Um, we historically get complaints, probably half a dozen um, before the season starts because we're opening late and they feel that there should be a discount from the $25 probably another half dozen at the end of the season because they could not get parking spaces last year for the 4th of July I had received five complaints after the 4th because they could not get a parking spot it says on the pass that we do not guarantee parking uh, we started that about three four years ago that was the same time when we suspended uh, non-resident boat pass so so yes but we're getting complaints either way but we got less but still yeah. Here you had a comment? yeah so to be clear you can still for anyone who didn't read the letter to the editor you can still launch and park your boat there you just cannot buy the season, season pass, pass which is provides a bit of a discount versus correct coming to do you know just coming and paying it when you when you come Right, and you actually can launch at the the park for free. And you pay for the parking. You can go move it somewhere else, move into neighborhood. We also have been providing for people because of the limited amount, and we don't know from day to day, week to week, if they'll even have the launch open because they're moving equipment in and stuff. Um, but we're giving them a map to the closest launch, which is the county one on the south side of the river. Mm -hmm. um, Black, black uh, what do you call that? Down by the Cedars? 
Yeah. No, Blackwell not Blackwell. There's actually a small county it's lot. It's on oh, right on Riverview Green Drive. Yeah. 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 Driftwood. Yeah. Yeah. Driftwood. Yeah. Yeah. Not Driftwood. Driftwood. I don't know. But I don't have a boat. I've got a tractor, and we have no parking for tractors. It's on Riverview Drive. Just. But we, west of Green right, but we're handing out a map and we're showing them what is at that green. site. It's small, it's not developed, it doesn't <laughs> even have a Santa can, but they get a picture of it so they can see it, they get a map to it and the description. And the point is, unfortunately, it's, it's inconvenient yeah. having a Vista, but it's that part of it's beyond right. our control. I, uh, fewer uh, complaints than typical, so unfortunately we can't make everybody happy all the time, but right. we try. I understand it's going to cost them more money. You know, right now it's if you come at in after three o'clock, it's five dollars. All day is six. Thanks. Do you have any questions today? No. I just make a comment that I appreciate you coming to us to talk about it, Dave. But I wouldn't sweat it. I'm not. And and we did present this information in public at a council meeting when Avista came and presented on the dam, and that was one of the complaints was that he didn't feel we had presented it at a public meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Council comments. Oh, I have. I would just like to say thank you. The last time I will say thank you. Well, not the last time I'll say thank you, but for this specific uh, event. But sincere thanks again, not just for this year, but through the years to the PD, uh, Park and Rec, the Streets Department, the permitting uh, people. It has been a pleasure working with y'all for 25 years on the parade. So I'm sure it'll be back next year and probably someone perkier than me. Will Thanks be for your help on it. Yeah, uh, it, it turned out great, yeah. but thank you all. Thank Appreciate you too, Linda. It. Anybody else? I would just like to add that I think it's gonna be very hard to find somebody to take your place. And I'm not just saying that, you have done a fabulous, fabulous job. I had a whistle, Betty Ann. I had a whistle. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Jeez, did she use it. <laughs> uh, Ellen. I would just like to mention she too, has. I spent a lot of time down here this weekend with the festival and I was Great. surprised. I was thankful to the city and everybody involved. Uh, you know, it was just a great event. I happened to go down to Camelin, you know, what, a couple hours after they closed it down. I couldn't find one speck of garbage anywhere. Oh, yeah. uh, I thought the citizens did an awesome job of picking up after themselves at the lawnmower races. I just thought it was a great, great event really makes you feel good about your hometown and that you know that home small town feeling that you get so it's proud of post falls this weekend i'm sorry i missed it i was family commitments out of town but i understand everything went well so thank you all for all your participation and contribution and there's no council or mayor whatever i am mayor comments uh <laughs> but i do understand we need an executive session yes move for to how, long? how long 10 minutes Right then that's what Ten. i've heard okay yeah. Move to enter into executive session pursuant to Idaho Code 67 2345 1C to conduct deliberations concerning labor negotiations or to acquire an interest in real property which is not owned by a public agency. Further, that no action will be taken during the session and the session will last no longer than 10 minutes. Second. second. Motion second. Further discussion? Clerk, please take the roll. Thorson? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Isong? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Motion carries. Enter executive session.
Oh, really? Back in session. Is there any motions to come forward? Do we adjourn. Adjourn. Yeah, adjourn. Motions and bunches of seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.